The row in our culture is not the row of 1973 Supreme Court decision or the 1992 Supreme Court decision. So if the Supreme Court is telling you, hey guys, this is over, you can go home now. We're not going to talk about abortion in the Constitution anymore. History tells us that that's not going to work. Hi, and welcome to Amicus Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and the Supreme Court. I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I cover these things for Slate. And this week, we wanted our New Year's Eve show to be about life after Dobbs for the simple reason that 2022, among many, many other things, ended reproductive freedom for about half the population in what will eventually be about mm, half the states. And proved to be not just a constitutional earthquake, but also, I think, a slow-rolling constitutional disaster that is still reshaping law around pregnancy and pregnancy loss, around surrogacy and IVF, access to contraception, the future of marriage equality, and the limits of free speech. So in a year that included a lot, the loss of Roe v. Wade was really a lot. Later on in the show, Slate Plus members will have access to my conversation with Mark Joseph Stern. Join us for our annual roundup of the worst of jurisprudence in this past year. Out of control federal judges, state attacks on LGBTQ kids and their parents, and how politicized reactions to the COVID pandemic continue to warp reason and records. If you are not a Slate Plus member, but you'd like to gain access— to not just my bonus conversations with Mark, but to extra content from, say, the Political Gab Fest or Slow Burn. And you think you might enjoy ad-free versions of all of Slate shows or unlimited articles on Slate.com or never hitting a paywall? Well, if all that sounds appealing, head on over to Slate.com slash Amicus Plus for details on how to become a Slate Plus member and... From the bottom of my heart, to our members, thank you so much. Your support is what makes our journalism and this podcast possible. Before we get to today's conversation, I also want to point absolutely anyone who has not listened in yet to download and binge Slate's most recent season of Slow Burn, Roe v. Wade. The season won Apple's inaugural Podcast of the Year Award this past month, and my dear friend and editor Susan Matthews is at the helm of this extraordinary work. Even if you caught it the first time around in June, Susan and the team have added really vital and illuminating extra episodes for the show's re-release following the Apple Award, including an interview with the amazing Peggy Cooper Davis. So yeah, do run, don't walk. And uh, listen in again. But now, time for the main event. To help us understand Dobbs and its fallout and the row-shaped hole in the American constitutional firmament, we turn now to Mary Ziegler, the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law at the University of California, Davis. She's the author of six books on the law, history, and politics of abortion and American conservatism. And her new book is Roe. The History of a National Obsession. It comes out on January 24th of 2023, published by Yale University Press. It is a smart and necessary read if you're still trying to contextualize Roe and Dobbs in this moment. So Mary, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. So you and I last spoke in the days after Dobbs, and I find myself wondering whether anything that happened in the almost six in- intervening months since Dobbs has surprised you or shocked you, whether it's states pressing punitive new rules or clinics closing or talk of a federal ban or referenda that took happen <clears throat> or the referenda that happened in the midterms. H- has any piece of the shifting post-Roe landscape taken you aback, or is this all largely what you expected would happen after Dobbs came down? Um, I, I mean, I think I've been surprised in in a few um, different directions. I think I expected there to be kind of fragmentation within the anti-abortion movement that would lead to, you know, potentially more extreme outcomes because there there's no single 
group driving the bus anymore. And I, I think I've seen that process, but it really accelerated. I didn't imagine it would go as quickly. And that, that's a little scary because it means that a lot of solutions that, you know, kind of the establishment of that movement would think would be a really bad idea may be on the table in some states sooner than I anticipated. And I, I have to admit, too, that I was surprised by how well ballot initiatives went for supporters of reproductive rights. I think they have not lost a single ballot initiative. And if you had asked me, you know, would I have thought that would have been true in a state like Kentucky, I would have said absolutely not. So I think I was surprised both by the amount of popular support for abortion rights and also really, frankly, that democracy worked that well <laughs> in those ballot initiatives because I was, I was, I've always seen this as sort of a stress test for democracy. And I think so far it's, it's been going better in, in that one limited way than I, I would have thought. Can you just give me an example, if you would, of something that you feel is the pro-life community getting out over its skis in a way that sort of shocked or surprised you? In other words, your f first half of the answer to that question, something that was getting pushed that you thought was way beyond what the sort of formal leadership thought was a good idea? Yeah, I mean, there, there are efforts to revive the Comstock Act. Lots of small towns now that uh, are part of the Sanctuary City for the Unborn Movement, which started in Texas and gave rise to SB8, which listeners probably know about. Those same folks are now passing ordinances saying essentially abortion is already illegal as a matter of federal law because of this 19th century anti-vice law called the Comstock Act that, among other things, banned, you know, naughty books, birth control, and abortion medication and devices. So I, I was surprised to see them going for, you know, essentially, hey, abortion is already illegal in New York and California because of this 19th century law that no one has really thought to enforce in a long time. That was surprising. The number of anti-abortion groups that are fighting popular exceptions like rape or incest exceptions in places where polling says that's a bad idea was surprising. Um, I think there's, there's, and I think that really the litmus test is going to be what happens when 2023 starts and we see how far legislators are willing to go to enforce these laws, if they really are willing to try to apply them to people doing things that are legal in the states where they're performing abortions or assisting people getting abortions, whether they try to somehow prevent people from traveling, which, I mean, the word is they are going to do. I've heard from them that they're interested in criminalizing CEOs and companies that reimburse employees for travel. Lots of those things, I think, are unpopular, probably not the smartest from the standpoint of alienating powerful people, not likely to be things that sit well, even with some Republicans and independents. But it's not hard to reconstruct why that's happening. But I question to some degree the, the wisdom strategically, obviously, as well as, you know, just these things being scary and a bad idea. So one of the things you just mentioned was a lingering question, both in Dobbs and post Dobbs, and that is, the states that want to reach out beyond their own borders to try to prohibit interstate travel, what they call, quote, abortion tourism, or, you know, the transportation of medication abortion in the mails, interstate. Those are things that was very hard to analyze constitutionally at the time because we couldn't quite figure out how states could do that. And Justice Kavanaugh insisted in his concurrence in Dobbs that none of this would ever happen. Do we have any, I know, we laugh. Do we have any more clarity six months on whether this is really the next front? I mean, states are really going to, you know, in this era of criminal penalties, liability for folks who, as you said, seek to allow others to travel interstate or states that seek to keep people from traveling interstate or providing medication across state lines. We'll talk about advice in a minute, but just these questions of travel freely among the states that, again, Justice Kavanaugh said, well, that's never going to happen. Do we have any sense now of how robust those efforts are? We're just beginning to see, right? I mean, so I know there are bills being pre-filed in states like Texas. We won't know until early next year or even into the spring if those bills are going to pass, right? Because 
you know, there have been bills filed in Texas to sentence women and other pregnant people who have abortions to death, and that hasn't gone anywhere yet, although apparently there's some support for that too. So it's hard to say for sure that we'll see these bills becoming law, but there's a lot of interest in a lot of conservative states in trying to regulate what happens outside their borders and trying to regulate travel. So I have to think that some of those are going to become law, but exactly how big of a push that is, I think we will need to wait until 2023 when, you know, legislators are actually voting on which of these bills become law. Let's take a quick break. You know, when you're waiting in line and you're just really bored, you know, that train is not coming or you're at the grocery store. Well, what if you had a go-to game that could instantly bring a hefty dose of fun to your day whenever you needed it? Get 1 million free coins when you download slot Omania to kickstart the fun. There's nothing more exhilarating than huge jackpots, special prizes, and free coin rewards every day. slot Omania makes every day fun-tastic with engaging graphics and realistic sound effects. With added perks like free spins and free coins, there's always something unexpected waiting. When your day is feeling stale, just ask, what will today spin? If you're 21 or older, you can join millions of players around the world. Download Slot Omania, the number one free slots game on the App Store or Google Play Store, and get 1 million free coins. That's Slot Omania on the App Store or Google Play Store for 1 million free coins. In March 2020, a family on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in Lame Deer, Montana, got shocking news about their loved one, Christy Woodenthigh. My daughter had came and notified me that Christy was run over. And I said, is she okay? And she's like, no, she died. I was like, what? Missing Justice from CBS News takes you inside what really happened that night and the federal investigation that followed. Listen to Missing Justice from CBS News on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. And we are back now with Mary Ziegler. So I do want to talk about the speech component of this because there's been a couple of really smart pieces, including a a great one you wrote a couple weeks ago with Michelle Goodwin about the ways in which free speech is going to be the next (laughs) battleground. And you mentioned the Comstock Act in the answer to the first question. But can you just sketch out for me and maybe give us a couple of the examples you cite in the piece, the ways in which going forward, abortion opponents are going to start to sweep up what we thought were constitutionally protected speech acts, whether it's giving advice or posting a website or aiding and abetting. Can you walk us through the gist of your argument that this is moving to the First Amendment? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so one way, if you're if you're the anti-abortion movement, right, you don't want to just pass a ban, you want to enforce it. And one way you can do that, as we just mentioned, is by trying to stop people from getting pills in the mail or from traveling. And it turns out that's really hard constitutionally, and it's really hard practically. The other strategy is just to stop people from getting any information about what their options are in the first place. And states have already been experimenting with this. The National Right to Life Committee, which is one of the bigger national anti-abortion groups, had a model bill that would essentially criminalize, you know, hosting a website with information about abortion providing most information about abortion. And that model law hasn't really gone anywhere, but that's partly because lots of leaders of the anti-abortion movement have essentially said, we don't need any law to do this. We already have criminal laws on aiding or abetting or conspiracy, right? So this is either like plotting to commit a crime or assisting someone else in committing a crime. And there are already some signs either that prosecutors are going to go after people for what many of us would consider speech, Or in some cases, like the University of Idaho had issued guidance essentially telling people not to talk about abortion in any kind of way that wasn't neutral because they were worried about prosecution. So sometimes there are going to be people in conservative states censoring themselves or their employees because they're afraid of criminal liability. And so I think this is a real concern. You know, if states, especially if states are struggling to stop people from traveling or getting pills, they're going to try to stop them from speaking about abortion or receiving information about it. And one example of that, that that I think maybe hasn't gotten enough attention right after Dobbs, we all heard the story of the 10 year old rape victim in Ohio who had to be transported to Indiana to terminate a pregnancy. 
Um, I'm not sure listeners know that the state of Indiana then went after the physician who provided that abortion. Um, Mm -hmm. And among other things, uh, they were going after her for speaking about it in the press. So this is an example, I think, of exactly what you're talking about, Mary, which is states are going to go after folks for seemingly protected speech under all sorts of theories of either you violated some medical ethics rule or you failed to report in a timely way. But mm-hmm. this this is a thing that you think is going to happen a lot or Indiana is an outlier? I think it's going to happen quite a bit. Um, and in part, you know, the First Amendment doctrine on this isn't well developed either. So again, this is kind of like we were talking about with travel where there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a little bit of, of doctrine about when, you know, speech is encouraging enough to be considered aiding or abetting, but there's not much and it's not very helpful. And so there are definitely going to be prosecutors who want to try this out. And there's a real animus toward advocacy groups and especially abortion funds within the anti-abortion movement that will motivate someone and probably lots of someone's to try, I think, using aiding or abetting laws in these ways. And the other prong of the First Amendment that's relevant here and that I think you mentioned in that article with Michelle Goodwin is First Amendment religion and conscience clauses. So I think you note in the piece, six states already allow pharmacists to refuse to dispense birth control, uh, not abortion medication, even though Plan B is considered, you know, the correct gold standard response in rape cases. I wonder if you talk for a minute about, in addition to these speech laws, how religious conscience laws are being deployed for refusal of services, not just for abortion, but for birth control? Sure, yeah. Since Really since the 90s, these um, conscience-based objections, some of which are rooted in, you know, the free exercise clause of the Constitution, some of which are rooted in other, you know, statutes like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, have really been expanding. So, I mean, the original laws were, you know, sort of you're a doctor with a really deep objection to abortion, you don't have to perform it. Now it's people who are, you know, several steps removed, like you're the insurer, you're the person who cleans the room after the abortion, you're the person on the phone taking, you know, the prescription for plan B, not even filling it. States uh, and, and advocacy groups have been proposing increasingly sweeping conscience protections And the other thing that's, I think, interesting about these is they are sweeping in contraceptives in part because they all operate under the framework that if someone believes something to be an abortion drug or to be against their faith, even if whatever the underlying belief is a factual one, and even if it isn't supported by the science, that doesn't matter, right? If the believer thinks that it's complicit, that's all that counts. So that makes it harder for people to access this kind of broad class of drugs that anti-abortion groups often d- define as abortive patients like emergency contraception. And it, it's worth emphasizing here that some groups in the movement are increasingly staking out the position that the birth control pill is an abortive patient too. So I don't think we've seen the end of kind of where these conscience laws are going to apply. I think we're just at the beginning of that process. And I want to stay on birth control for one more minute, if we can. In the last couple of weeks, we saw a Texas judge issuing a ruling, I think is one of the first efforts to go after birth control access through Title X. This is the federal program that offers grants to health providers to fund family planning services. And on December 8th, we saw a Texas judge finding that Title X, quote, violates the constitutional right of parents to direct the upbringing of their children, end quote, because this allows minors to get contraception without their parental consent. One of the things that was a huge issue after Dobbs, and I know you and I talked about it at the time, was the slippery slope from abortion, abortifacient contraception. Is it fair to say that this is one of the signals that birth control very, very much gets swept in into the conversation around Dobbs? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing so the kind of two early arguments that you saw against abortion were either ones about minors and parents or arguments that abortion was actually really bad for the health of women and pregnant people. Right. These were arguments that were thought to resonate with people who were kind of, you know, on the fence about abortion. And so it's no surprise now that we're seeing the same arguments made about birth control. Right. And in fact, historically, we we saw them made 
about birth control too, when people in the anti-abortion movement and the rest of the religious right thought they would resonate. I, I think parental rights and women's health are kind of the low hanging fruit from the standpoint of people in the anti-abortion movement. So this is kind of, I think, the beginning of what will likely be an effort to at least restrict or maybe even outright ban all chemical contraceptives, right? IUDs, the birth control pill, emergency contraceptives and the like. Give me the sort of theory of why bans on chemical contraception is different from bans on uh, what's the... What's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Non chemical. Uh, what? what <laughs> yeah. How how does it differ from condoms and uh, IUDs? Well, so most most people in the anti-abortion movement would view IUDs as in the same category, right? So they would say there's all the drugs they say are abortifacient drugs because they say they pl- prevent implantation of a fertilized egg, which is not what most obstetricians say those drugs do. But that's what people in the anti-abortion movement think. And then they they also have the list of chemical contraceptives that they think are kind of unnatural and likely to interfere with the fertility of women, right? Condoms is an interesting case because it's hard at this point to say we're against condoms because they're abortifacients, which is clearly, I mean, there's not even a possible, not laugh out loud way you can make that argument. And you can't make that argument about health either. So I think at that point, when you're willing to say we want to ban condoms, you really are only talking about sex, right? Um, and I think that makes it a heavier lift for the movement. The movement for a while kind of realized it was a bad idea to seem like they were just anti-sex um, and they had stayed away from those arguments. So we may, I mean, would it surprise me if we got to a point where condoms were swept in? No, right? The University of Idaho's guidance that I mentioned earlier also essentially says university health services shouldn't be distributing uh, condoms for contraceptive purposes, not just other forms of birth control. So I, I, do, I do think that, that that may be where we end up, but I think that's a little ways down the road because it's a harder argument to make. So I want to turn to your book, Mary, which is just such a, a, a big, sweeping, historical look at Roe and its place in history. And I, I think one of the things you're arguing, and I know you were having to revise it in light of Dobbs, but one of the things that you explain is how Roe goes from a case in 1973, that's just a case about facts in Roe, to a phenomenon, to a symbol, to much more. And the ways in which the leaders of both right to life groups and abortion rights groups had to make all these decisions about how to import meaning into what was just a case. Um, It's very much in keeping with something we keep talking about on the show, which is, you know, we, we focus too much on the case and not enough on the world around that case. And I think that's very much a theme in your book. Can you just help us understand? I know it sounds like I'm about to say, please give us a pricey of the entire book, but can you help us understand how the world originally understood Roe when it landed and how it kind of changed in the years immediately after? Yeah, I think the book kind of started from this kind of mystery, right? Which was like, why do we talk so much about Roe? Because even before Dobbs, Roe wasn't the law anymore. It was a case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And I mean, now after Dobbs, right, you still hear, you know, Joe Biden saying, I'm going to save Roe or make Roe the law of the land. Like, we're still talking about Roe as kind of our touchstone, even though it's been overturned. And people, you know, on the left and the right didn't really love Roe. So it was sort of weird to me that we had this fixation on Roe. So I was interested in why that was. And in researching for the book, I found that, you know, in the 70s, Roe started out as this kind of fairly boring and kind of unsatisfying decision about how doctors had the right to practice medicine as they saw fit and work with their patients to make the best decision. But pretty quickly, lots of people, right, politicians, social movements, regular people began to make Roe mean all these other things. Some of them are really obvious, right? Like you associate Roe with a woman's right to choose, which isn't really even in the original opinion. But there, it was pulled into all these other interesting conversations too that I wasn't as aware of. So conversations about the role of the judiciary and democracy, um, conversations about work-life balance for women and other folks who can get pregnant, um, conversations about race and reproduction, particularly um, sort of why is it that people of color having abortions at higher rates and struggling more with racism, 
religious liberty, like we already mentioned, even just sexual violence. So what I was finding was that people often complained that Roe was kind of the elephant in the room that crowded out more nuanced conversations about abortion. And that's not entirely wrong. But what I found sometimes was when people were obsessing with Roe, they were kind of channeling all the nuance into what they meant by Roe. So it gave me hope that we could talk about abortion in saner ways. And it also gave me hope that the Supreme Court is not somehow able to take away our ability to think and reason and change what we mean about these issues, because the court in Roe completely failed to do that, right? Like the Roe in our culture is not the Roe of 1973 Supreme Court decision or the 1992 Supreme Court decision. So if the Supreme Court is telling you, hey guys, this is over, you can go home now. We're not going to talk about abortion in the Constitution anymore. History tells us that that's not going to work. Time for a brief pause to hear from our wonderful sponsors. Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, and I'm here to tell you that we have a special offer on Slate memberships. You can now get three months of Slate Plus for just $15, and you'll get no ads on any Slate podcasts, member-exclusive episodes and segments on my show Amicus, and shows like Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. And best of all, you would be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism as we cover everything that is happening in the news every day. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcast plus. Again, that's three months for only $15. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. Let's return now to my conversation with Mary Ziegler. Do you have some ability, having done all this research, to imagine a way, I hate this counterfactual, but you're the only person I'm going to ask it to, (laughs) how Justice Blackman could have written Roe in 1973 to sweep in all the various nuance and meaning and, you know, political and religious and health valences that he missed entirely because he was at the Mayo Clinic thinking he was doing a science paper. In other words, if you could go back in time and ghostwrite Roe for him in a way that might have made it multifaceted and complicated and thus more robust, is there a thing you would have done different? I mean, definitely you could have improved on the original Roe opinion. So part of the answer to the question is, you know, yes, right? I mean, and there are different ideas that people have developed since. I think most people think focusing on equality rather than privacy would have been better. Focusing on the history of Reconstruction and the second founding and how much concerns about forced pregnancy of enslaved women motivated the second founding and Reconstruction would have been helpful. But at the same time, I I kind of am not as upset that Roe, as it was written, was not that compelling because it it ultimately, in some ways, I don't know how much it mattered. I think Roe would have been overturned anyway. I think Roe being overturned had less to do with the reasoning of the decision than it did with kind of broader changes to our democracy that had been wrought by the anti-abortion movement. And Roe turned into this really unique cultural icon. I mean, it's, I think unlike any other Supreme Court decision, honestly, because of the rest of us, because everybody else added to Roe what Justice Blackman left out, right? So I think it's a story about popular constitutionalism. Um, So even though I I agree with a lot of really smart people, like Michelle Goodwin, whom you mentioned, and Melissa Murray, and others who've written about this, that there are obviously ways to improve dramatically on Roe, I think a lot of us have been kind of doing that in effect in the years since, because what we thought we mean by Roe, and even what the court thought Roe meant in recent years, was not what the court said in 1973. So a lot of other people have contributed to what it's come to stand for. And do you feel comfortable giving us a theory of why? I mean, I think the the thesis of the book is we all rushed, as you said, to import meaning into Roe and then it became everything, even when it wasn't that. What is it about abortion? Was it the moment? Was it the 70s? Was it religion? Was it race? Is it all the above that made Roe, as you put it, this singular symbolic case that has shaped constitutional thought in ways that Roe never anticipated for 50 years? 
Yeah, it's hard to say, right? Because Roe occupies this really unique role. So lawyers sometimes talk about what they call like the canon and the anti-canon. These are like, to the extent anyone knows about Supreme Court decisions, they're either the canon, like the things we all agree are right, even if we don't agree on why they're right or what they mean, like, you know, the Supreme Court's decisions on desegregation, or, you know, anti-canon, like decisions we think all are terrible, right? Even if we don't agree on why they're terrible or what they mean. And Roe kind of never fit in either of those categories, right? And I think this is why it was compelling to people. It was sort of the symbol, like the shorthand of all our national disagreements, right? It came to embody, like, why do we disagree about science? Why do we disagree about gender? Why do we disagree about religion? Why do we disagree about race? Or, or do we? right? Are the disagreements as intense or are they the same, maybe even unfamiliar disagreements? So I think that's part of what captivated us because Roe was doing this cultural work as sort of shorthand for our divides and how deep they were, whether we'd identified them correctly. And there's no other real Supreme Court decision I think that's ever been in that category, at least that's well recognized in the way Roe was. I want to ask you this As a historian, first and foremost, because I think we're at this very, very odd moment with this conservative supermajority, whether it's Dobbs or Bruin, the guns case, or um, the Indian Child Welfare Act, where history has become the lodestar at the court for Mm -hmm. all things. And I want to give you a chance to answer maybe a slightly tricky two-part question, which is, How did Justice Alito in the Dobbs majority get the history wrong if he did? Mm -hmm. And more urgently, what this is the meta part of the two part question. Happy New Year, Mary. Uh, But like (laughs) what what does this turn to history do to the conversation about Roe? Well, I mean, okay, so I think the biggest problem with the way Justice Alito uses history is that if you ask a historian a question, no, no matter who it is or what the question is, their, their default, what they're going to want to tell you is it's complicated or it's messy, or there's no straightforward answer to this question. And Justice Alito and Dobbs uses history the way like a child would use like a gumball machine, right? Where you like put in a quarter and a gumball comes out, like, or a <laughs> magic eight ball or something, right? And that's just not how history works. So when you're asking history to do something it can't do, you're necessarily going to get weird answers. And so... What that means essentially is there's some things, there's a consensus within the academy that for a long time, abortion before quickening, right, before fetal movement could be detected, wasn't criminalized and wasn't punished. And to ignore that consensus, Justice Alito has to find essentially the only three people who disagree with that consensus who are not really full time historians. And one of them was a Christian bioethicist. One of them was a law professor who worked with the National Right to Life Committee. One of them was a land and water expert at Villanova who, you know, also had been attending conferences, you know, for years entitled like how to reverse row through the courts. That's not to say that their history is necessarily bad, but it is to say that you're getting a very one sided perspective when you're ignoring the majority of scholars in favor of three people who don't write about history unless it's to write about abortion. And Alito's doing that without acknowledging that there's a dispute, right? There's nothing here to say that history is contestable or contested. It's kind of like, he's like, there's just nothing to see here, folks. The same goes for when he talks about the motives for 19th century abortion bans. He doesn't credit the idea that there could be any creepy nativism or sexism that was motivating these laws, again, despite lots of evidence to the contrary. So there's a sort of oversimplification and whitewashing that I think is sort of (laughs) emblematic of a bigger problem in Dobbs, which is to say that it's not just that Justice Alito destroys abortion rights, it's that he sort of makes it sound like it was no big deal even, right? This was not even hard. There's no empathy, there's no awareness of the complexity of the question constitutionally or historically. And I think that's a symptom of something you see with the court's use of history generally. So, I mean, in terms of what the use of history means generally, again, I think it's often history that's being used to short circuit deeper conversations about stakes, about values, about what the court is actually doing. And that isn't to say history isn't a valuable tool, 
But the way the court uses history in cases like Dobbs and Bruin is essentially to, is cherry picking in a way that is unusual, even in the history of courts cherry picking, right? Like, so they're ignoring lots of things and, and also, as I mentioned, not even acknowledging that there could be or is, in fact, disagreement. So I think we're seeing a way of the court kind of making it harder for the public to engage on these questions or anyone really to engage on these questions by relying on obscure historical narratives that don't have a lot of support in the academy. And I think that's bad for the court. And I think it's bad for constitutional discourse because the court is not the only one sworn to uphold the constitution. It's not the only one that has skin in the game when it comes to the constitution. So the harder it is for regular people to participate in conversations about the constitution, I think the worse off we all are. So tell me if I'm now misapplying the central thesis of your book to what you just said. Part of the problem is that the popular discourse around Roe and Casey and its progeny for 50 years was to render it kind of cartoonish, right? A simple binary, Roe, not Roe, you Mm -hmm. know, abortion, not abortion. And by doing that, we collectively made it easier for Justice Alito to operate in a too simple cartoonish binary of row not row. In other words, it takes two to tango. And that we as a society have been complicit in allowing Justice Alito to shrink row down to something much smaller than it ever was. Yeah, there's this kind of weird contradiction in how we've interacted with row, right? Because on the one hand, the kind of row, not row dichotomy is there. And it also always assumed that like, okay, if row is there or not, like if we have rights or not, not just with abortion, but anything, you know, we're going to ask the Supreme Court. And yet when we actually talked about row and all the meanings we attached to row, we totally ignored what the Supreme Court was saying, right? All the meaning making was happening like almost everywhere else, like state legislatures, Congress, social movements. And so I think The history is helpful in letting us see that, like, not only does the kind of cartoonish row, not row, not really capture what we've been thinking, but also the idea that somehow, like, we've just been way too deferential to the Supreme Court, right? And way too kind of just asleep at the switch in terms of, like, we're going to rely on the court to give us rights. We're not going to pay attention to where else rights could come from. You know, when the Supreme Court says a right is gone, we're going to, and I mean, I count myself in this really more if it's gone. Instead of asking, you know, why is it that we think the Supreme Court gives us rights and takes them away, right? I mean, that is a question that I'm not even sure the answer to that. But I think the way we've handled or thought about Roe suggests that we've never been as deferential to the court in the way we actually live our lives than we've thought. And that's the helpful starting point when the court is saying things that we, you know, we don't agree with and we find really disturbing (laughs) and wrong, so... So it leads me to the prescriptive, I mean, it being New Year and you being you, the prescriptive part of this interview, which is how would we do better? I mean, I think you're quite right. And in a lot of interviews um, after Dobbs, I heard a lot of particularly women of color saying Roe was never really Roe. You know, it was the basement, not the ceiling. It never protected us. And certainly after Hyde never protected huge swaths of the country in much the same way that after Brown, we heard that Brown was never really Brown, right? And Mm -hmm. Brown had to be corrected because of that. So it does raise this question of if in fact we are much too magical in our thinking about an on-off switch, rights, not rights, constitutional uh, guarantee of freedom, not. What's the more nuanced, complicated way to think about this? Because I think you're quite right. If for vast numbers of pregnant people across the country, Roe never gave what it purported to give, Mm -hmm. what's the way to think about this going forward, particularly for folks who as you say, think that something magical happened in June of 2022 that, in fact, had never really captured what we thought it captured in the first instance. Yeah, well, I mean, it it kind of goes back to, like, why are some of the same people who never liked Roe still talking about Roe? And it's because in places like state legislatures and ballot initiatives and elsewhere, they gave it, 
Like they made it cooler than it really was. So all of those channels are still open, right? Like you can have ballot initiatives like we've had in states already. You can have state legislatures introducing protections. You can try to get Congress in a, you know, not right now, but eventually to think about what these kinds of like a right could look like. Um, and so I think, you know, in some ways, the row that we actually didn't dislike, the row that actually was valuable, was the one that the Supreme Court didn't really create in the first place. So that idea, like those ideas of what reproductive rights or justice could look like, are still on the table and the channels for making them real are still on the table too, right? Uh, the Supreme Court in Roe didn't enact a national ban, didn't shut down lots of ways that we could protect abortion rights. So I think it's a helpful moment to remember that when we create constitutional protections or legal protections, we have a lot of levers to pull, not just litigation at the Supreme Court. And the history of how we've talked about Roe shows we've been already been doing that for a while. Even when we've kind of obsessed about the Supreme Court, we've already kind of known how to do this. So it's just the moment to remember that and start pulling the levers again. I love what you're saying, Mary, because what it signals is that the problem of Dobbs is also the solution, which is that Dobbs is just a, the barest outline of what we think of as a rights conversation that, in fact, is because of having imported all these other meanings onto it for years uh, are still there. Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, the way I think about this is like Roe is a zombie. Like it's like Roe is dead, long live Roe, because all the it's going to continue to take on these meanings and it may continue to motivate people. Um, and if that's true, that's great, right? Then it's just another thing that'll add fuel to the fire of people who are more mobilizing and organizing in really kind of cool new ways, right? Um, that we haven't seen as much in the era when 1973 Roe was still around. So the other big theme that this all connects to is legitimacy of the court, which you think about a lot in the book. You just wrote a really smart uh, piece about it. I wonder if you would connect up for us this question that I've been struggling to answer when people pose it to me, which is, how big a deal was all this for the court? And, you know, pollsters before the midterms advised us that women had normalized Dobbs and moved on after two weeks. That seems to be wrong. And as you suggested, it was certainly wrong in terms of ballot initiatives, including in states that in every other, you know, governmental decision, tick the box for leaders who opposed abortion, but nevertheless showed up for abortion rights. So I wonder what your own sense is of this question of whether Americans have now just integrated Dobbs into, well, this happened, or has some version of zombie row radicalized them in ways they don't fully understand? I guess I'm just wondering the extent to which you think what the court did in Dobbs in June of 2022 has fundamentally changed the relationship between American public and the court? Or is it a thing that kind of like Bush v. Gore, it, it sort of sucked for a couple minutes. People thought about the court differently. They integrated and moved on. I think the answer is sort of TBD. And I think that's because Dobbs is going to be like Roe in, in the sense that we don't know what Dobbs is going to be made to mean, because guess what? Sam Alito doesn't get to decide that either. And some of the people who get to decide that are the state legislators who are doing things that are really unpopular. So if you take a state like Kentucky, for example, we have pretty reliable polling that people in Kentucky want a lot of abortion restrictions. But then they started to see what their state was doing and they were like, whoa, wait a minute. We don't want no exceptions you know, from conception. Like that's that's not what we meant. We may think that we're pro-life, but we don't, that's not what we meant by that. And so I think how radicalizing Dobbs is will depend on what a lot of people make Dobbs mean on the ground in the real lives of pregnant people. And thus far, the signs are that it will be bad enough <laughs> that people will be mobilizing. I think to the extent the court contributed to that, there was a kind of tone that Justice Toledo took, essentially, that people who were harmed by his opinion were not worthy of consideration and that people with whom he disagreed were not worthy of kind of 
serious intellectual reflection, I think to the extent that's signaling, it's essentially saying to legislators and activists, hey, you know, it's open season. We don't have a problem with almost anything anymore. But again, do I think that's most of what's driving people? No. I mean, I think, again, people in state legislatures and the anti-abortion movement have their own ideas about what Dobbs ought to mean and what the Constitution says. And they're going to try to make Dobbs mean things that Sam Alito didn't say in June 2022. So I think how much this reconfigures American politics is something we'll probably get to see much more in the new year. But the signs, I think, the early signs are there that this is not going to be push v. gore. This is going to be something that has some effects for a while. And before I let you go, I do want you to answer this question of the court and legitimacy, because as you just hinted at, but maybe talk more explicitly about it, one of the mysteries of the last, I would say, term and a half at the court is that in the face of, you know, plummeting approval ratings and what seemed to be quite a pileup of ethics scandals and just a general feeling that the American public, whether measured by, you know, new Quinnipiac polls or a Gallup polling, is not okay uh, with not just Dobbs, uh, but as you said, the tone of Dobbs, the tone generally, but also the big, big swings that we're seeing at the court. And as you noted recently in an op-ed, and as I've been saying, one of the things that's fascinating is that this is fixable by the justices, and yet they seem to choose not to fix it. So I'm going to ask you to <laughs> to play us out on this question of what is it? Again, you can answer as a historian or uh, uh, as Mary, but mm-hmm. what is it about this moment that seems to let the majority of the Supreme Court and certainly the conservative supermajority be so unfussed about the degree to which the public has major, major questions about its legitimacy? I think there are two things. I think there's a different kind of conservative on the court now, a kind of more movement aligned judge, someone who is, you know, not as concerned about the court as an institution, um, doesn't really identify as a steward of the court and has more fidelity to what they see as kind of ideas and even movements. So essentially, The type of person on the court right now in the conservative supermajority doesn't really care what the public thinks, doesn't really care what most people in the legal community think, because that's not where their professional identities are centered. The other thing, I think, is essentially that the court's conservative supermajority is essentially betting on the idea that this is Bush v. Gore, and even more than that, that there will be no consequences to the court as an institution, right? That the court can go off the rails and do things that everybody hates. And that at the end of the day, everyone will just say, oh, well, you know, we still are going to defer to the court and listen to the court. So um, again, that's a bet that they've made. And so whether that turns out to be accurate or not is something that we all have some say about, right? I mean, How does the Supreme Court enforce its decisions? Is there a serious conversation about court reform that happens? Um, Are there efforts to try to work around the Supreme Court? Lots of questions like that I don't think have answers, but the justices seem to think that no one is really going to do much about what they've been transforming when it comes to the law. And, you know, I, I have to hope they're wrong because it's not healthy for the court and it's not healthy for the rest of us if the court can be kind of counter-majoritarian in the way that the justices now seem to think they can. Mary Ziegler is the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law at the University of California, Davis. She's the author of six books on the law, history, and politics of abortion and American conservatism. And her brand new book, Roe, The History of a National Obsession, comes out at the end of January, published by Yale University Press. It is absolutely the right book for this moment if you want to try to understand what just happened in 2022. Mary, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Yeah, anytime. It's always fun. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus and for this year on Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in. Thank you for your support this past year, whether that happened through your Slate Plus membership or 
purchase of my book or leaving a review for the show so other folks could find us more easily or just by getting in touch and sending us your amazing letters and questions and thoughts. We have really been through quite a lot together in 2022 and we are grateful for you. You can always stay in touch at amicus at slate.com and you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Today's show was produced by Sarah Birmingham. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio and Ben Richmond is senior director of operations for podcasts at Slate. We will be back with another episode of Amicus in two short weeks. 2023, here we come. Until then, do take good care of yourselves. And thanks for listening.